Hey, what's up, y'all? Welcome to Conversations by Heavy Cardboard. Happy to be joined by a very good friend of mine and as well as good friend of the show, Cole Worley. So if you guys are new to these, it's been a while since I've done these. These are our long form interviews. I originally was going to do a long form interview with Cole uh, at PAX on, uh, sorry, PAX East. However, uh, the fact that I asked, I solicited for questions and I got a whole bunch of questions and I thought, you know what, why don't I make this into a long form interview? So that's exactly what I decided to do. Cole was agreeable to this um, and having just left PAX East, thought we would go ahead and get into it. So um, if you're not familiar with Cole Worley, he is, well, you know what, before I get into all that, why don't I just, hold on, let's go ahead. And welcome in, Cole. So, hi, Cole. Hey, Edward. All right. Uh, so, Cole Worley, designer of a, a number of games that you guys have probably know about. John Company and Infamous Traffic, the upcoming PAX premiere, and, of course, the smash hit that is Root. Uh, yeah. So, Cole, thanks for joining me today, man. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. All right. So if anybody out there watching live on YouTube has any questions, uh, I'm going to save those for the end. Uh, the production team, i.e. myself and uh, Tony, one of our mods, is going to be helping me with that. And we'll try and get to them there at the end. Uh, so that said, um, cool. Uh, PAX East just ended. Uh, you visited Boston. You had a day off. At the I did. Convention and you went to the JFK Museum. How was PAX East and uh, the museum? This was the first con that we had time off. It's sort of a new concept, but our team is just getting large enough that we were able to sort of give everybody a half day off. So I went to the JFK Museum. I could I can tick it off my uh, my list of presidential libraries. It was interesting. Um, I think I think the best one for people like interested in the the top hits of presidential libraries i still like the lbj museum i think right. the most which well it's you know it's in austin which is great um but the jfk one was good uh it right now is not a great time to see it because the final act the assassination in the legacy section is under construction so you go through it all and you're like ooh, i wonder what's gonna happen next and then it just stops <laughs> and you just get shunted out. So oh. it's a bit of a cliffhanger. Yeah, right. And, I, and I, I won't give anybody any spoilers about what happens. But I would say, man, wait a few months before you go to the JFK Museum. But it was still pretty cool. The actual building itself is awesome and is in a great location. So I, totally check it out. It, it, see, and I haven't been able to play tourist yet here in Boston. So I'm looking forward to being able to do that and Bunker Hill and mm -hmm. all this stuff this spring and summer around conventions and everything else. So cool I'll, uh, I'll i'll put that on the list but postpone it for a little yeah, bit yeah just there. just a little bit how uh how did you guys find pax east uh pax east is great it i mean we went so my first one was last year and i it was one of my favorite shows i've ever been to i i have a weird relationship to shows in general you know i went to gen con growing up a lot and it was a show where i bought a bunch of things and then i ran home and played them and then I started going to BGCon, which is where Edward, you and I first met. Or not first met, but first met in person. And BGCon right. is so primed around playing, right? Like, how many games can you play in these four or five days? Uh, and I, so I'm still, I still feel like I'm trying to find my, my footing for how to deal with the professional con. And mostly these days, it's like, what people do I want to see and hang out with? Uh, and then that's kind of it. Like, it's my little con family. It's the people I get to see five or six times a year now. Right. And I just want to make sure that I get to connect and keep up. And maybe they introduce me to interesting folks. And I try to do the same. Uh, and PAX East is a bit of a special show because it, for people who haven't been there, it's a PAX show. But it, it has the most balance between the digital scene and the tabletop scene. So, like, PAX East is predominantly a video game show. Right. Uh, and it's a very chaotic, and there's lots of tournaments going on. It's very loud. And there's definitely a lot of that in PAX East, too. But there's a really big tabletop scene as well. And I find that people are weirdly at ease. Like, even on the digital side, when I would go hang out with some of my friends who work as devs for indie game companies... They're just kind of relaxed. It's it's, it's weirdly low key, despite the energy of the floor and everything. Right, and it, and it, it's, yeah, it's a massive it's a massive space too. Is well oh yeah, I mean. it's huge. I mean, it is. 
it feels bigger than Gen Con, like the main hub floor in Gen Con, although both spaces are so large that I'd have a hard time comparing them. It's certainly taller than Gen Con. Like yeah, the like ceiling is higher. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right, and, right. and it, you know, there are these giant exhibits. The exhibits are very, very expensive. Uh, and it's just, it's a, it's, it's a blast. I mean, I, I initially wasn't going to go to PAX East because I had just gotten back from GDC and was, it was exhausted, but I, I just, I couldn't miss it. And so, uh, and I'm, and I'm glad I went, you know, there were lots of, uh, good games played and kind of interesting conversations and things that just all the good reasons to go to a show. They all happened again. And so already I'm looking forward to the next one, even though I'm exhausted. Oh, no doubt. Uh, one nice thing, at least on my end, is the fact that PAX East now is my home convention, or at least one of, and so I get to sleep in my own bed. Which, so there's something to be said for <laughs> that. Uh, yeah, PAX East was a good time. It was a, a good chance to catch up with everybody. Uh, for me, the highlight, other than playing PAX Premier, four times while I was there was uh, checking out the Oculus, which is staggering just where things are going video game wise. It had a big enough impact on me that I wanted to uh, start saving up for an Oculus Rift S. I last year, one of the things I always try to do at the PAX shows is they have a lot of um, small schools or small video game mm -hmm. design programs, right, right. and they're always like showing off their games in the booth. And I played in a VR game last year where you were on a bicycle. It was a bicycle racing game, but you were on a bicycle like a uh, like an indoor like stationary bicycle, but it could tilt back and forth and. It was the most immersive video game experience I've ever had. I thought I was going to fall off my bike at one point. It just felt like I, I've just, I don't know. I've been playing video games for a long time, and I have a hard time seeing my seeing the industry like pivot to VR in any kind of like gigantic way. But just as it comes to like individual experiences, right. I mean, some of them are incredible. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, the Oculus. It it definitely messed up my my sense of balance a little bit like you felt like you were going to be falling and it was yeah it's it's pretty impressive where things uh, are going um also how'd you find chinatown while you were here in town it was great and i wanted to go back so bad like we we had you know our our super late night dinner right and then every night i was like come on guys let's go to chinatown we don't need to eat around the con hall let's go to china and I, it never quite worked and i think next time i'm just going to draft people and force them to get in lifts with me and, and take them there because yeah, there were uh, so many there were so many places i wanted to eat that i didn't get to go back to i know uh so after you and i stream by the way uh for those in chat saying the sound uh levels are, are off hopefully that's a little bit better um i will try and fix that a little bit better for you guys but uh after we got done streaming uh pax premiere um we went ahead and uh, went, you were like, oh, I'm, I'm a bit peckish. And, oh, I want somebody to uh, to hang out with. And, hey, you guys want to go grab something to eat? And we were like, yeah, let's, let's, go, let's go to uh, Chinatown. And so we took you there. It was, I don't know, 2 in the morning. And uh, the hot and sour soup in Chinatown at that one place is fantastic. But, yeah, um, I gave up good uh mexican food in in denver and uh got uh, got chinatown in exchange so it worked out all right let's get into things there um all right so it's been a year since we last sat for an interview you and i mm -hmm. which was at pax east it was a con interview so it was a smaller yeah. one and it's been a little bit longer since you and i sat down for this but things have definitely changed a bit for you uh, at that point, you had recently started working full time for Leader Games, and now a year on, how are things in the uh, Upper Midwest? They're, I mean, it's incredible, right? So you, it was interesting. We talked to PAX East. At that point, we had just submitted Root, so we had already had the Kickstarter do really well. I've been working there for a few months. We had submitted the game. We were all real happy with it, um, but you know. I think one weird, one thing about Root, even late into development, past development, as we were showing it at shows when it was at the factory, uh, it's a it's a strange game, and it's it's strange just kind of tugged at us like, oh, this is peculiar. Like we have no idea how well it's going to do, um, and w I don't think any of us could have like even remotely anticipated what the response was going to be. So like we had a betting pool when, as soon as the games got <laughs> within in within the office. Within the office about how long it would take to sell through the first print run. And I, you know, I, I don't, I feel like I understand uh, my segment 
of the market, and I, I have a I feel like I have a reasonable understanding of Patrick's segment. But so I, I didn't I didn't make these. I wasn't being like frivolous or pessimistic or anything. Right. But I was like, I think we're definitely going to sell out like in April, in April of this year for the first print run. <laughs> and I was so wrong. <laughs> like so, I mean, we were sold out of the first print run. I think like in a week or two, the second print run was sold out like a month before it arrived. And these aren't like, I don't mean this to like humble brag because I'll just brag about, it. I mean, it's, I think the game's good and it's done well and I'm, I'm proud of it, but right. it, I, I just, I mean it not, not as a boast, but just as a measure of my own ignorance when we talked like last, last April, Be, because I, I just didn't know. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to think about what my year looked like. So what happened was we, in April, uh, we were done with Root. We started launching the Vast Kickstarter, which I worked on a lot. And then over the summer, like I was developing the second Vast game with uh, Nick Brockman, who's uh, our graphic designer and kind of our, the junior developer on staff. And we worked, I mean, I spent probably four or five months just absolutely working on that game uh, and got it to a place I, I was really happy with. And then uh, we also, my brother and I started working on the pack stuff on our spare time. So, I mean, I like you encountered me, I feel like at the end of a really busy period and I was very exhausted and now it seems so refreshing compared to the amount of exhaustion. <laughs> ever. Uh, I mean, it was really, I, I thought I was at the end of something and I was going to be able to kind of slowly adjust to a new normal. And in fact, like it, uh, the year since has been much, much busier. But it seems like you have adjusted pretty well to it. Oh yeah, well, I mean, we 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 love it here, right? Like I think I I cannot imagine like leaving the Upper Midwest, like both regionally and also like I'm really happy at, at Leader. It's a strange all all call, small companies are strange in their own way, but I like the strangeness of this one. So what makes what makes this particular strangeness appealing to you at Leader? So a small for those people who've worked for small companies know this, but you um, there are, aren't traditional boundaries like you you know you will do like there there there's work to be done and then you just have to apply yourself to it as best you can and then if you feel like you can't do it you find somebody else but there's a there's a lot of different hat wearing and a lot of people uh, there, there's just a lot of collaboration and working quickly and then also kind of shifting your jobs and your responsibilities it's very fluid and one one thing that's nice about it is because there are no specific roles i mean even when like they're you're attempting to do specific roles how a game gets made changes from one game to another so you're always kind of shifting position and so i i had liked working at small companies uh for that reason but oops let me turn on my my giant screen light there we go uh so i i had liked working at small companies for that reason uh, because I, I like th that kind of fluidity but at leader one of the things that i i really like about about this particular position is uh, it has really strong creative infrastructure. And what I mean by that is um, Kyle is an amazing illustrator and that's easy to know when you like just look at uh, what he produced with Root or any of his other projects. Uh, but what is not so easily seen in his illustrations is that he's a magnificent collaborator and he has really interesting insights. Um, and, you know, with, with Vast and Mysterious Manor, I found myself and Nick contributing a lot to the core design in the same way that when I was working on Root, like Patrick was contributing to the core design. So all of those collaborations, they kind of unsettle the notion that like any game is a single person's work a little bit. Uh, the way we tend to think about it in the studio is like the person who ends up with the design credit is sort of the person who's captain of the ship during the course of that ship's journey, but you just can't do it alone. And so you get a lot of sort of dense, knotty collaboration over the course of these projects. Uh, and that was something I didn't have when I was working completely by myself. Interesting. So what uh, you talked about, uh, Kyle being really good at collaborating. What, this might sound stupid, but what makes somebody a good collaborator? Like what, what is that? Well, part of it has to do with how people bring you into their process. So with an illustrator, a traditional illustrator, you're going to give maybe an art board, like some style boards or an inspiration board. I can't remember. They have different names, but just you give them a pile of things where you're like, I want it to look kind of like this. Yeah, just for to give them a direction yeah, in which to right. go. That makes sense. And then, and then you also give them, um, 
you you might give them a copy of the game so they understand how it plays. Um, but you're also going to give them kind of a detailed art list where you're like, okay, I need a squirrel with a sword and you know something like that. Um, and then what the illustrator will give you back is usually like a sketch, which you can critique, and then the final thing. Right, and the sketch but, being that, you know, hey, before I go too da far right. down this road, make sure we're on the same page, right? Yeah, and what Kyle does is he he lets us, and we, we try to reciprocate this relationship as much as possible. Um, he lets us into the creative process really, really, really early, like even before the sketch, the sketch stage. And we try to let him in the design process even before we actually get to what looks like classical design. So when we're doing something more like world building or like the really high concept, like this is what we want the game to be. Um, and so when you are working in a really early place, everything you produce is garbage. I mean, it, it's just like <laughs> you haven't had time to leverage your own skill and, and your work. And so everything is bad. Um, and so in order to let somebody see all the bad stuff, uh, you have to kind of like be in a position of vulnerability. And to me, that is the heart of really, really good collaboration that you can like, I trust Kyle. I know that if I like when it comes time to give him an art list for products I'm working on, that he's going to completely blow me away. But I also want him to, I, I want those illustrations to reflect not just like my own wants at the top of the project, but I want to bring him in to the earliest steps of the world build. And I want him to feel like he can bring me in so we can have conversations about philosophy and art and all these kind of high, high concept things that we want to inform the design, but that we don't have to dictate to each other necessarily. And so to me, like collaboration is about this kind of vulnerability and it's, it's about intimacy. And one of the things about the team at leader games is that this is a really close group of people. Now, and I hope I'm not overstepping by by putting this out here, but you had talked about how thing you would you guys were talking about possibly expanding um, a little bit, but wanting to limit that because mm -hmm. of exactly what it is that you're talking about, right? Yeah. Well, this is one place where. So one of the things that, that we've maybe this way I'll frame it. We, we've been thinking about the possibility of doing some fan factions and maybe a contest. We're not really sure what this is going to look like yet, but there's a lot of interest in it. And I think it's a good idea, but um, all of the material that we've made for Root so far has kind of like come out of the same cauldron. And I think it shows in the design and we sort of want to keep it like that. So even if we do end up like enlisting the help of our wonderful fans who've produced all kinds of interesting work, we would want to like take it and put it in put it in the cauldron and, and develop it ourselves as well a little bit. And this isn't like I think that that anxiety could be expressed as um, you know quality control or just general control. But it's really it has more to do with like we just want to have everything be properly seasoned, right? And like to right. be coming from from the same place. And that's a hard thing to do at remote. You know, we've had to make a couple hires over the past year, and. It, most of the work in the game industry is done remotely. And I think we're one of the few shops, especially at our size, that when we do look for applicants, like a willingness to be able to move or to be local is pretty much a disqualifying. Like you, you just, you, you have to be here. Why, why do you think that's so important? Because we sit, so we, we're in a little office. I sit across, I make eyes at Nick, our, our graphic designer and the junior developer all day. Like he and I talk constantly and it's important because we get pulled into play tests everybody knows what everything else everyone else is doing if i'm having a development meeting with patrick uh and you know marshall who's on an operations team here's something that he doesn't like or that you know that he thinks should be critiqued and you know moved in a different way he is of course free to like jump in that meeting and then we might kick him out later but you know but absolutely jump in the meeting right and that is very hard to do with the remote staff and so you know, we do have a couple of remote staff members. Uh, Carol da is, um, she works on marketing and all of our customer relations. She's based in Toronto. And then we have Kyle, who is based in Utah. And 
there are time. I mean, I it, things certain things would be a lot easier if they were both based locally. Now there are cir circumstances. These are kind of the first major employees of the company, right? So that they get a little bit of a pass on this. <laughs> sure. um, yeah, but in order to king and queen or whatever, right? No, right. Uh, it, right. But in order in order to sort of keep Kyle within the office, I find myself writing little updates to him every few days. Like, hey, here were a bunch of little side conversations and bits of office and industry gossip that you missed because they didn't make like our weekly meeting. Uh, just so we're all kind of on the same page, but but that takes real effort. And, and to make and make him feel included as if he were there to some degree, right? Right, of, of course. All right. So speaking of Root, though, what is it? Obviously, if everybody knew the answer to this question, there would be nothing but hits in the board game <laughs> industry, I understand. Sure. But what is it about Root? that you think has caught people's imagination and has made it the success that it is? So there, the, I think that this is a really big question and one that we are still sorting through, still well, trying to every, figure out. Everybody. Everybody is. Everybody I is. mean, if everybody could make a Magic the Gathering or a sure, Ticket to Ride and, or... And, and I think magic, so, you know, I go to Proto Spiels and people say, hey, this is my Magic the Gathering killer. And if they ever tell me that, I will just walk away because... Uh, I don't think you can do really good design work in a reactive posture, right? Like, and, and I think the success of Root there is, and, and this is obviously there are massive differences of scale here, but what's similar to the success of something like Magic or some of the other like more seminal games is that it capitalized on an audience that we didn't know existed and we didn't even really, like, you know, we, we had no sense of the, of the scale of this audience. Um, but it was it was particular to the time of its release and to all the it had, there were all basically all of these other kind of gears that were lining up in ways that Root was able to capitalize on. But I wouldn't if I were a publisher at another firm trying to sort of angle for a similar audience, I wouldn't attempt anything like a Root knockoff. Um, not because I want to like keep all of, <laughs> all of the Root dollars in one right, spot, right. But, but, but just because I I feel like. Reactive design uh, is a really dangerous and risky game to play, and uh, in general, you should be trying to think about, and this is at least my own personal practice, look for the questions that kind of resonate with you, and then maybe they will resonate with other people, and if they don't, maybe they'll resonate with enough that you'll be able to sort of like do another project. And so with, with Root, I mean, the, the thing I think that helped Root is obviously it it has this, it has a, a really wonderful presentation. And that is very, 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 very important. Um, but the present, like being cute isn't enough. There were lots of cute games that came out last year. Uh, and being masterfully illustrated, like also isn't enough. Games are getting very, very, very beautiful. I think the thing that helped Root is that it's a pretty mean interactive game that doesn't, it kind of, I, the way I've come to explain it is that, um, you know, when you, so when you think about light war games traditionally, uh, what they do is they take the, the drapery of war and then they make it like a set collector or like a card game or something, right? So like memoir is sort of a war game and, but it's also like a hand management game a right. little bit. Commands and colors, that whole right. series uh, of the, family the of games. Right. The example that I will often use uh, when I'm kind of thinking through this is something like Eric Lang's Blood Rage, uh, which is a, sort of a draft. I mean, it's a drafting game. It's a drafting game. Um, the like weird blood splattery Viking theme with all the Adrian Smith art, like it's, it's Sushi Go. And that is no detriment to Blood Rage. I mean, Sushi Go is a great game. But the way that the light war game is approached is that nothing about this game mechanically feels like war. So we have to make the game really look like war. And what we did with Root is we said, okay, what if mechanically the game is very much about war? Well, that's going to make people uncomfortable, make people feel bad. So it needs to be themed in such a way as it gives people a little bit of distance so that they can be mean in a sort of more of a Warner Brothers comic way than like a, you know, like a capital hate way, you know, in the CMA. I'm, I'm picking on CMA. I don't know. No, no, no. But I know I, I, I get what you're saying. But that first off, so this, this, I have so many questions. Uh, so first one is whose idea was it that, that concept, the fact that, okay, this is legitimate 
I mean, you are beating the hell out of one another. This is a war game. Let's make it cute and, and distanced, uh, yeah. if you will. Who Was that a... How did that come about? Was that you? Was that Kyle? Was how how did that come about? So there's a really uh, sort of thick alchemy that ha that happened in the early days of this project about how we were going to approach it because I've been wanting to make an accessible conflict game for a while, but didn't really know how to do it. Patrick gives me a kind of pitch to work with, which is this sort of asymmetrical strategy game, and at that point, like it doesn't really have a theme. So we were just kind of like approaching it uh, from a purely mechanical standpoint. And then Patrick had been working on this game called Path, uh, which he's still working on, and which is a big open-world adventure game that is set in this kind of animal kingdom. I mean, essentially is set in the world of Root, uh, which is actually more properly like the world of Path. But at that point, it wasn't like there wasn't a vision document for what the world was going to look like. The game had a vision document, but there, there weren't any rules to like whatever the, this kingdom was, except... Uh, that Kyle liked drawing for and had been thinking through it. So Kyle and I had a bunch of calls where we talked about it. Originally, we were going to do more of a fantasy setting, but as soon as we thought, like, okay, well, if Path happens, maybe we want to develop this as a broader IP. Um, and Kyle and I, we spent a long time talking about animal parables and going back and forth and thinking about, like, Disney's Robin Hood. Uh, so, like, there were a few key texts, like, obviously, Redwall, which is all over the game. Um, Disney's Robin Hood is really important for Kyle and for me. That, that was an important movie growing up. But also, in terms of the way Disney's Robin Hood approaches drama and violence, I mean, the movie is somewhat adult. Um, but it really it gives people distance with those animals. And then I had to, to add to that, I've been thinking a lot about, like, Watership Down. Uh, and Watership Down isn't a medieval it isn't a story that's dressed up to be medieval. It's quite um, fabulous. I mean, not fabulous. It, 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 it's Watership Down is almost like a fable, and and it has this sort of it's, a, it's almost like a biblical story or something, um, because there's a violence to it, but there's also prophecy and mythology, and so as we were thinking through this world, you know, I, we, we kind of built this like this like shorthand script of things that we wanted out of it. And I was very adamant about like uh, a very set, a strong set of materialist politics. So like it, I didn't want there to be magic. Uh, if it were fantastic, um, I wanted it again to be like in this sort of like fable voice, like a little bit more like Watership Down. Um, we kind of position it in the British tradition. Um, so like a lot of the woodland creatures like happen to be like, you know, of the British Isles or, or near, we, we, we did cheat a little bit on that, but you know, when, when earlier when I was talking about collaboration, like the, the, the approach that like we could make this game very mean with this theme didn't come from any one of us. It kind of came from, from this intersection. And then what happened was, so there were, there were these two kind of weird things that happened that really allowed us to, to push this forward. Um, so I've been working on, uh, on affect studies, which is like how people deal with emotions and how we think about our emotions in games. And I've been writing about the coin games. And I found that uh, when I would use them in a classroom setting, that they uh, horrified people. Uh, they scared the hell out of them. Uh, people did not like the feeling of being a terrorist. Makes to total sense. And um, I think that would be a natural feeling for most oh yeah, anyone completely. who isn't. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but, you know, it, but, but there's, um, you know, when you play a war game, the rules and honorableness of war allows you to have a little bit of distance from the fact that like you're stabbing somebody <laughs> um, or, you know, or whatever horrible thing, like right. you're not stabbing them, you're defeating them. But with, with, um, with unconventional w warfare, the acts and the position are all bound up a little bit more tightly. And so, you know, people don't have any problem uh, or most war gamers don't have any problem playing, uh, you know, the Nazis in World War II, to use the classic example, but uh, playing the FARC or the Taliban or the, the U.S. forces, for that matter, um, th these are things that rub people the wrong way. Uh, and so I had that in the back of my mind. And then when I actually got to design the game, you know, as you know, I tend to like sort of like mean interactive designs. No. And what I, w what I was finding was that uh, players didn't mind if they were cute animals. And so that allowed me to push the design a lot meaner than I might have been able to do otherwise. Huh. All right. So on the flip side of that, though, because let's face it, 
I think, and, and I think you would agree with this, that part of the appeal of Root is the cute, adorable world that you guys have set this in, be it Kyle and the whole sure. collaboration, the whole nine yards. However, it's also a bit of a misnomer because it is this super cute, adorable artwork that's nasty. I mean, yeah. it's a, Root is a straight up nasty, mean game. Mm -hmm. And I think that has thrown a number of folks. So how do you reconcile that, that you have, I'm not going to say, and I don't mean it that you sold them a bill of goods that is not sure. honest, but you, I mean, a coin game, uh, you look at GMT's coin games, any of them, mm -hmm. you know exactly what you're getting into when you get that game. Root, if you just look at it and, you know, you read the back of the box and the whole nine yards, okay, you get a, a, a some sense of it, but it's not, I mean, they seem very... Yeah, well, it, to one another, right? There is a there is a little bit of a dissonance, and it's not happening between the game mechanically and the game thematically. It's happening between the game and the marketing. And what we tried to do. So this is actually a nice thing about working for a small company. Uh, when when they have meetings about marketing and advertising, I hear everything because I can't help but hear everything because it's four feet away from my desk, <laughs> and I always try to lean into the fact that the game is interactive and a little mean. And this is why, you know, when we advertise, when we pull quotes from, from reviewers, um, I'm like, look, we need to emphasize interaction. When we talk to our people who run our booths about how to sell the game, I tell them like, look, this is an interactive game. You know, the thing I, I will often say in my own pitch is only play this game if one, you like playing the same game a lot because it rewards exploration. And two, if you're okay with the fact that your buddy is going to put pieces on the board and then you are going to take those pieces off the board. And if, if you can't get past that, then like there are lots of other games that are, are just waiting for you. Um, but I, I just, personally, I try to lean into it a lot. Now, in terms of um, the overall position, the one thing I, I will say on that, on that regard is part of, so, Wargamers tend to be a bunch of middle-aged white men. And I think this has a lot to do with how the industry, and when I say industry here, I mean like the biggest way of viewing it possible, like toy makers, how we treat children and their toys. And it's a very long and old, old story, right? Or, you know, it doesn't, it's not even necessarily that old of a story, but um, the way things get gendered. And part of like the back argument of Root was, I think more people are interested in conflict games than would otherwise be interested in them. And so that you was sort the, of the way they're marketed. Yeah. The way they're marketed. I think, you know, a lot of, and you know, GMT is a great company. Um, but I think that there are more people who are who would be interested in multilateral conflict games than you would otherwise know because these games aren't being marketed to the, the full base. And so root, you know, in our marketing, we have leaned into the fact that it's a conflict game. Um, we don't we don't try to be dishonest, and even in the smallest way, like there's no trickery involved. But when when we think about future projects and what our takeaways are from Root, one of those takeaways is there are more players who like this type of game than people want to realize. I mean, and let's be honest, your sales reflect that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this we uh, Root has done really well for the company, and we have every reason to keep doing projects that, if not more Root, are like Root because there are people out there who want to play them. All right. Well, on that note, um, and I'll double back to the other things that I had. But any hints on future Root and what your and the group, and by the group I mean Leader Games, Patrick, sure. and everybody else, what your guys' vision is for the long term for that? Yeah. So we, you know. We're a small company right now. Basically, we can only finish one game at a time because of how it just every like you know if we are getting root like right now we're getting root through the Kickstarter campaign and then into production and it's going to take it's all hands on deck type venture uh, and we kind of like it that way. Uh, it's exhausting sometimes, but it means that um, we don't have like an A team and a B team. We don't have like okay now it's you guys who do the hits. You get a year off. Everybody else is going to work on another thing. Um, and I think. You know, we are likely going to grow a little bit, but at least when I'm in the organizational meetings, I'm going to be arguing for like, let's keep it small. 
keep it focused. Um, we have a couple things on offer right now. So uh, Mysterious Manor will come out this summer, I th which is the second Vast game. I think it's going to really surprise people. Uh, it is uh, mean and interesting and a very clean design. I'm really proud of how everyone kind of like put their head into it. Uh, it's definitely Patrick's game, but it was... Um, it was it was really fun to work on, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, so that that comes out this summer, and then uh, we have some time. So I tend to so Patrick, the the metaphor I use in the office is Patrick is really into stir frying. He's always working on like two dozen projects, and he works a little bit one week, and then he puts it aside. He works on the other one a little bit, and maybe they start get gaining gravity, or maybe they don't, and he kind of goes to a different one. So he's got lots of projects that are in. Um, I have lots of projects too, but I like to stew. I like to work on one, maybe two projects at most at once, and all the other projects I just throw away or I write in a book and never look at again. Uh, so the one I'm, I've been working on for a while, uh, the working title of the game is Saga. It won't be called that because um, we'll get sued maybe by some other game called Saga or something. Um, but the working title is Saga. And uh, th this has been an interesting game for me to work on. I've been working on it for... Six months, seven months, um, and it, it's been moving along pretty pretty well. I'm I'm happy with it. It I have thrown away many many iterations of this design um, because it's not like it has some high concept things going on, and I've produced a bunch of games and none of them are good enough to deserve the high concept. And so I'll play it. It works. It's fine. I'll throw it away. I'll start over. So I'm getting ready to work on I think iteration six of the design. It's still like a ways from from sharing what the actual design looks like. But the the kind of top-down view is it's... So Root is a game about geopolitics. It's a game about sort of like what constitutes a state. This is a question I'm really interested in. Like PAX is kind of about a similar question. Uh, Saga is about history in the abstract. How does history get told? How do stories develop on a generational scale? What things get remembered and th what things get forgotten? Uh, it's kind of a legacy game, but I don't really like legacy games. Um, I actually, I, I very much don't like them. Uh, but I, I think that there's there are places where I can see that space going that would be more to my liking. And so this is like my spin on a legacy game. Uh, you don't destroy the game while you play it, <laughs> for one. Uh, but basically, um, the the core idea of the game is that depending on how one game goes, it kind of creates like a layer of history. And then the next games are played on top of that history. So legacy and, in that respect, but not. Yeah, it's like not quite a campaign game. It, so the, the basic thing is, it's a legacy game that is that has no scripted elements. Um, which on on the back end, on the design side, means that I'm having to do a lot of work to make sure it can like. So okay. Um, just to, I'm gonna get get in the weeds for like a second about the, how how this actually works. I think people enjoy this. We okay, win. so yeah, the, I'm gonna I, I'll get in the weeds. So um, when we talk about gameplay mechanisms, uh, one thing that I'm really attracted to are expressive uh, systems, systems where the players can be very creative and and kind of do interesting things. They have a lot of room to play. Uh, so I'm looking for those. Uh, and then I also like things that are emergent, things that I didn't know that it was going to set up into a 2v2 and then that 2v2 was going to break down, uh, but that's how the game happened, right? There's all emergent gameplay, emergent strategies. Um, most good games have these things. These aren't like my secret sauce. Like, this is true of, of most games. Uh, but the way legacy games work, I'll take Pandemic Legacy as an example. Uh, Pandemic remains a very expressive and emergent game for a co-op, I think especially. Uh, but the actual legacy structure is very scripted. Um, I, I, I think, uh, and I, I mean this not necessarily as a put down, but I think legacy games are usually better television than they are games uh, because everything is kind of like laid out. It feels like a little bit like a script of a play. And the script can branch in different ways, but usually all of the cool emergent stuff, the stuff that attracts me to games in the first place, that's only occurring within the space of the game and not in the space in between games, because that stuff's scripted. And you, you can have, uh, you know, these scripts can get like more nonlinear and more complicated, but they're still scripted. So what I've been doing with Saga is creating, like trying to make the meta game around each individual match of Saga as interesting as the actual game itself. So that what I would like to see is, you know, a copy of Saga on the used market in 10 years somebody opens it up and 
the game has gone through 30 or 40 generations and there is this deep history that the players can uncover as they play the game. Um, from the previous owners. From, from, the, from, from the previous owners. And like there, there are things that uh, it's very lossy. So like things can get buried and hidden and rediscovered several games later. There's no persistence of players. So like when, you know, one of the things that I think can frustrate players about something like Gloomhaven is if some people in your group don't show, they, you know, they're out, they, they, they can fall a little behind. It's like hard to get everybody together. This, it doesn't really matter who shows up to play. Like it's, there are, there's a clean break from each match, but the actual game that's being played is being built organically by the players over each play. Um, and it feels, you know, ag- the idea for it actually came back to, so the idea is related to sort of like two separate moments. Um, one, uh, the way my brother and I play Pax for Furiana. So when we play packs, we will uh, use the same deck many times. So we will we'll, we will play a match, and then we'll put it in the box, and we'll take it out, and we'll we'll play with the same set of cards, and then every once in a while we'll slide in some different cards. At random, and that, yeah, at random, and it will kind of chew. It'll it'll it changes the story a little bit, but it also gives the game a kind of like strategic anchor because you know that like okay, this is an enterprise light deck that we've been playing. Certain strategies are better than others, et cetera. This is one reason why I think that um, Renaissance really grabbed people. The card count of, Ren- of Renaissance is pretty small compared to Perfuriana, so you can predict things. So that was one thing that like was really in my mind. And then uh, after Patrick and I finished Root, we were just talking about kind of like where we want to see asymmetrical strategy games go. And one uh, one option that I gave him was a system where it was still asymmetric, but one player was the kind of government ruling class player, and then the other players were people who were trying to contest that uh, hegemony. And so that's that's the central drama of Saga. Like, one player is the ruling class, everybody else is trying to get into that position. At the end of the game, the conditions that led to the ousting of the ruling class will sort of, like, create the next evolution in the game's mechanisms and the previous ruling class might be exiled. They might entrench. There's all sorts of different things, but, the, but the, the, the metagame system is really responsive. So a it weird thing, awfully ambitious. I mean, I've been working on it for a long time and it's, it is by far the most ambitious thing I've ever, I've ever worked on. Um, <laughs> it, but it, what's nice about it is because roots done well, I have the time to do it really. I have the, I have the time to direct our, personal resources and company resources at it. And Kyle and I have been working on the world building for four or five months in, in earnest. We've got like tons of art um, for it. And we have, we have a real sense of like how we want the game to look and present itself. Um, and it, you know, the earliest, I think I'm probably going to be starting a proper design blog about it in maybe three or four months. I have a lot of written material. I've probably, I don't know. I'm pro- I've probably got like 50 or 60,000 words of saga design material that I've just, I don't, I want to wait till, so I really like being transparent about my process, but I want to wait till I have a little bit of distance before I start sharing. Uh, and I don't feel like I have that distance yet when it comes to the game. Why is that distance important to you? Because I think when you, so on board game geek, there are these things called work in progress threads. Uh, and I've never really liked them because I think when, when you present like a design essay, uh, sometimes you're presenting it because you want help, which is, I think is the default. Um, but then there, there's upkeep associated with it because there are people who want to talk to you about the decisions you've made and they want to offer you know their own interesting thoughts about, about the, the design. Um, I think that like that it, it's taken me a long time to create a small team of like confidants and developers and other designers that I really trust. And when I talk about design, like those are the people I want to ask my questions to. And when I open up like a product, if I like live design anything, I would much rather like have that. I want I want to sort of pick who's going to be in my little circle when I'm doing that work. Uh, if I give myself distance doing it, I still feel like I can let folks see what the des- what the process looks like on the back end. But I, I want it to be more like a study and process and not 
like I'm crowdsourcing my right, job. after the fact. Right. right. Kind and, of, and, yeah. yeah. And I think people, you know, Patrick, for instance, loves work in progress threads. He loves that kind of like fruitful crowd surf, uh, crowdsourcing. And I think that that's great to me. I, I think I prefer to work by myself more and kind of sort it out or sort it out with, with a small group of people. Um, and, and the reason why I'm transparent at all is I found when I was starting to learn the basics of design that most of the designers I really respected didn't write a much much about their own process. And when they did, it was very perfunctory. Like when you read like a Martin Wallace little essay in one of the Tree Frog games, like he, he sort of tells you how the game got made. Like the one I always think about is the one in Automobile where he says like, yeah, I wanted to make a game about cars and I thought I had it working and then I went to this like game con and we like rebuilt it in two days and then it was really working. But it doesn't really get more specific like that. And to me, it's like they're not telling all the interesting stuff. All the hard stuff isn't getting talked about. Um, and so I, I, you know, to the best of my ability, I want to talk about the hard stuff and how the, you know, you, you make these decisions when you're making a design about the shape a design is going to take, uh, and and they have real consequence and gravity. And you know, it was interesting. Uh, I went back and reread as we were getting ready for the root campaign. I reread all this, the writing I'd done about root, and I'm really happy I did that writing because even though certain ideas drifted away from there, it was a good record of my thinking at that time. And I hope that people who are interested in design can like play root and then see the thinking that went into it and realize. A l like understand a little bit more about like how this art form really works and kind of see, see where the brush strokes are. I think people, that's part of what makes you so appealing to it. Not just uh, talking about Cole Worley, the person, not the, uh, the games that you've created. I think that letting people behind the curtain, I think is something that people truly appreciate. And even something like this, where people can, hear the way you think about things to me feels so different than everybody else that I've spoken to about game design. And I've taught, you know, I have a number of game designer friends and just, you're just off the reservation in a good way. No. And you know yeah. what I mean by that? Like you just come at it from an angle that I don't think anybody else does outside of maybe, you know, I, I, I tend to join you two at the hip, but you and Phil Eklund from a design standpoint, yeah. at least. Well, I, you know, I will say to that, I've, okay, so I've now been in the industry, the, the industry for right. uh, a year and a half or so. And when I go to these cons, I see a lot of good friends that I've made that work at different companies and people are talking about projects they're working on. Um, I still feel very much like an outsider, uh, in, in a good way. I mean, I love these people. They've been very welcoming. Um, but I think that I um, I want different things from the... Like, I think ultimately I'm still like a very selfish <laughs> designer. Like, I, uh, I would have a hard time working on a project that I wasn't personally interested in, that I didn't want to play. That, why is that selfish? That sounds like well, common but, sense. You but, have well, to have but, but now I But now I'm doing it professionally, right? And so if I need to design a game that is going to like meet this certain audience expectation, uh, you know, if I'm being a professional about it, I just need to do the job. No, right? hold on. No, see, I disagree because, and this is why in correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like you're such a good match with leader games because Patrick, I don't think necessarily. And, and for those that don't know, Patrick being Patrick leader, leader games, I don't think he wants that. Does he? No, I think no, he wants he, exactly what it is that you're saying. Yeah, well, th this is why uh, this one of the many reasons why this job was so attractive to me is that he gives Patrick trusts his team, gives his team a lot of leeway, and when I'm like you know, so Saga right now, I will say. Um, no one at the studio has played it yet. I've been working on it for a long time. No one has played. It. I won't let people play it because it's not it's not good enough yet for them. Um, and I've, I've talked about it with it, but I just, I'm like, I don't want to waste your time with this game. I'm going to wait till it's, till it's actually like good. Uh, but I, I know that Patrick trusts me on it and I don't want to, I just don't want to waste his time right now. Um, but I mean, I do actually, I do think there is value to sort of like being a finisher and being someone who, okay, we've got the SpongeBob license. We need to make a card game. 
it's got to be this long. I, I mean, I think that there is real beauty in that craft. It's not something that I can do. So, you know, we had a conversation in the office several weeks ago where we were talking about like intellectual properties that we'd want to work with. People are like, oh, I want to work with this video game franchise. That'd be amazing. I've all, you know, I've been playing this game since I was a kid. I have, I have none. And it's not that I'm not a fan of things. Like I read a lot, I watch a lot, I, I like media. I just, when it comes to games, I don't want to be in somebody else's world. I either want to be in a world I'm working on or a world I'm working on with other people. Well, this is what you. This goes back to what you said. Like you don't want to have somebody make the next magic killer. You want your own space. Right, and 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 here's the thing, like, it can do badly. Like, that's, like, I mean, believe me, the Root Success has been an absolutely, like, amazing thing to be part of. Um, but as we're thinking about designs, like, you know, even w w with Saga, in the back of my head, I'm thinking, like, look, I don't know who this game is for, but I'm not going to answer that question right now because I'm just trying to figure out, like, if there's a compelling story here and then I'll let the marketing team worry about who the game is for. Uh, and that, that's a tremendous place of privilege, um, to, to, to be from. But, you know, when I was, this is, this is a little bit of a lesson from graduate school for me, because when, when I was in graduate school, there was always a tension between finding a project interesting and then also trying to read the tea leaves of where the conversation was and then go and be talking about the conversation. Uh, and that second thing made me miserable. And I think I enjoyed graduate school so much because I felt like I was doing a project that was personally interesting to me. And I didn't really care if it got published in the top journal because it wasn't the flavor of the month. That that didn't really matter. Um, but, you know, I also wouldn't have been very competitive on the academic job market in my field because I had written a lot, but it was in my own, like, weird little space that I was working in. Um, and... I feel tremendously grateful that there is an audience around my work that's large enough that can support me to keep doing my work. I mean, that's like not nothing happens without that audience. Um, but I feel like to do that right by that audience, I just have to like keep doing the things that are resonating with me. And you know, when I talk to someone like Tom Russell um, about this, like I think he and I have pretty similar feelings about this. Yeah, like, you, you got to be I, true I to yourself. A, I think that's a perfect analogy. Actually, the fact that nobody wants you to change. Everybody likes your brand of quirkiness. And I mean that again, as a compliment, because you're so different than everything else that is out there. As far as board games, they're just, they're just different. They're, they're, they're like, it's funny. Like people, people, a lot of people like to, typecast certain games oh it's a euro it's a meritrash it's a war game it's this and then there's cole's games which are <laughs> they're their own animal right. and i think that makes a lot of sense so two things now one you completely avoided my question about what's coming with root well oh, done yes. by the way <laughs> uh so we're gonna double back on that and number two I realize that Saga hasn't even been uh, tested by anybody or touched by anybody else in the office. From the my gut, this sounds like 2021, something like that. Yeah, probably. Okay. All yeah. right. So double back on route. Is there more available in that space? Yeah. So, well, I'll say with respect to Saga, we, so we the one of the ways that we think on the back end uh, at the company is that we have um, – sort of production slots not production slots exactly but a slot whereby a game can be finished kickstarted finished more and then sent to factory uh, and the next one of those so we are lucky because roots done really well we don't actually we, we don't have the same financial pressure that like means like we have to act now like sure. when root went to kickstarter it was using the slot that was like either our last slot or our second to last slot so we had to make sure it was going to be good. Um, the next one that we have coming up is like a fall or early winter. Uh, so fall of this year, or early winter next year. Um, so it's conceivable that Saga could get that slot. Or if I want to work on it more, I could ask Patrick to just like push it back or we can put something else in front of it. So I would guess that like at earliest it comes to Kickstarter in the late fall or in the early uh 
early part of next year and then is released either later that year or the year after. Okay. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think uh, Root took about 10 months from kickstart to delivery, about that, or nine months maybe. And that that is about the, the rate that I think we're going to keep going at. Um, so for Root stuff, so right now, right, I mean, I guess uh, I should say because we have a Kickstarter on, um, we've got an expansion right now. You can go on Kickstarter right now and get it. It's called the Underworld expansion. It's been bananas. Um, I won't I won't uh, sell it too much because it has done that work for me. Um, <laughs> it, it's been a really fun Kickstarter to work on because we um, there are no stretch goals, there are no gimmicks. We just like what is the best deal we can offer to the audience? There. Okay, there it is. And then uh, here are a bunch of print and play kits. Hey, all you people who enjoyed like Root Party One, here's Root Party Two. Um, and it, it's been a lot of it's been a lot of fun working on that project. Uh, we have some development work to do. Um, we when we launch a Kickstarter, we always freeze the development so that we're still thinking about the games, but we don't mess with it because we want to to pitch it and present it. Um, but we've had this like large like head of steam that is built up, and now that the the Kickstarter is ending, uh, we're going to go in the shop and tear everything up and try to make it even better. Uh, and I'm I'm excited for that process because it's always thrilling. Um, so we're we're going to do that, uh, and that will be out by the fall or uh, by about, I think to, you know. So like we're we're going to obviously shoot for Christmas. It may come a few months early uh, in the same way that Root did, but you know you, you can never know with those things. Right, right. Um, we have some other Root stuff in the works. Uh, that is interesting. We have some partnerships with people that we really, really like who've produced awesome Root fan content that we may develop into a non-Kickstarter pre-order that like, just for the people who really like Root and want more Root, we have more stuff for them. Cool. Uh, this has actually been an interesting thing about uh, the folks that like Root. They don't necessarily like want to play whatever the game of the week is like, the, like I, I thought that this audience was going to be closer to the standard Euro game BGG audience. I and they're not, played it a handful of times and move on and then move on. And that has not been true at all. These are a lot more like cosmic encounter fans in that they play cosmic encounter every week. They want more cosmic encounter. And you know, it's easy to laugh when you're on the outside of that group and be like, do you really need all 200 of those aliens? But if you're in that group, it's like, no, 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 yes, definitely. We play this game every week. Um, so uh, because of that, we, we, we're we going to continue supporting supporting the game. I have another Root expansion, which is a prequel expansion that uh, contains like alternate versions of some of the factions that behave very, very differently, but use some of the same pieces. So before they evolved into the base of Root. Of what right, they're... but... Well, and, and and actually, so prequel both thematically and, and mechanically. So, for instance, I have a version where the eerie, the birds sort of start owning the board, and then the cat has to invade. Um, and it is difficult, and it's a very, very different dynamic. But it because I'm playing with, with those core, what we used to call core factions, um, if, if I can get them to work, it just completely multiplies out the possibilities of what the way you can mix the factions. Um, so I've got those. Um, we have some other factions. Basically, everyone in the office has like two or three factions. Like pet factions that they're working oh, on? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That are just like – that they're all good or, you know, are on their way to be very good. But we, and, and it's not like – it's sort of like when you work at a game company, you just can't help but design because who knows? Like maybe they're going to call you in. Like, hey, guys, <laughs> put it in my faction; it's ready. Um, and so we actually we have a really deep stable of new root uh, stuff that we want to share with people. Um, and I actually like so. For instance, I have a I have a draft of something like a root campaign system um, that I I, I want to do. I'm kind of putting it on hold because I want to do Saga first. Um, because it might like, I, I would just, I don't like working on multiple projects at the same time. And I especially don't want to work on multiple projects. Like the idea. So my general idea is like, if you have a really good idea, you shouldn't save it for some future project. You should deploy everything you have at the immediate project because it's either going to work or it's not going to work. And don't worry about your future projects. Like they will take care of themselves when they're old enough. Um, and so, yeah, so we have a lot of root stuff. The thing that I that I am cognizant of is 
Uh, there is a lot of fatigue in the industry around uh, the, the churn of new games. And so for this reason, like, Root is going to be something that we're going to support. We're going to keep, like, watching the numbers and kind of keeping everything adjusted. Every every expansion is going to come out with a, like, the, the most updated rule book and kind of the old GMT style. Uh, we want everybody to be on, on the same page. Uh, we want to do our best to support the product. But we also don't want to like do three root kickstarters in a year and just cash in on the audience because i mean that's a real temptation um but to me i I feel like you know for a game i support and a new expansion with more content coming out every year or every 16 months or something that to me feels right like for the audience like that's there we're showing that we are continually directing resources towards it um but we also like you know I, I think it can be exhausting. I feel like one reason why um, Kickstarters from major companies have started to flag a little bit is because they're just going to the well too many times. And like, I just, you know, if you haven't had time to really play through the thing that you already got, I'm a lot less inclined to back the thing that's going to be coming. And so, you know, our, our, our whole MO is just make things that people play and keep playing. And we would rather have a very small stable of evergreens that we work really, really, really hard on and that are really good uh, than trying to be uh, the most efficient and most uh, productive. And publisher. I think people appreciate that. And honestly, I'm I'm on board with that. There, there's a couple other things that I want you to focus on we'll get to here. And so much for that, <laughs> we're only going to go an hour today. Yeah, well, uh, no, no, this is amazing. I'm on board with this. So, all right, briefly, briefly, cool. Vast mm-hmm. 2.0. You have intimated that it is, pardon the pun, but vastly different than the original uh, iteration of it. So you want to give folks a little bit, a, yeah. a, not elevator pitch, but synopsis of the difference. Okay, so Vast was the, the first major game that Patrick published. Uh, he, he had designed other games before that, but Vast was the first like big title that he published. And uh, it has an interesting provenance. Um the original design came from a man named David Somerville, who had a really cool, provocative, like radically asymmetric framework. Uh, when Patrick played it, I think he rightly said, okay, this game that David pitched is a little light, but the people who are going to want this game are going to want something with a little meat on its bones. And so the game got heavier for it. And then he actually had a whole stable of um, people helping him on the development side, kind of like getting the game finished and polished. Uh, and I think I think Vast is a seminal title, uh, but it also is the kind of game that's made by a big stable of people, and it's very much like a first major project in a lot of ways. Uh, with Vast and Mysterious Manor, so while I was working on Root, Patrick was working on Vast and Mysterious Manor, which is conceived as a full box sequel to Vast. You can borrow roles between the, the two games, uh, and it, it pretty much follows the general design rubric of Vast, but while Patrick was working on Vast, um, we were learning a lot about doing this kind of design work with Root. And so in Root, I tried to apply a lot of lessons I felt like I had learned from Vast. Uh, and then as we watched Root get released and get played, um, we just kept learning. And so um, in late summer, Patrick handed the design to me and uh, our graphic designer, Nick Brockman. And we looked at it and said, OK, um, it's absolutely bursting with good ideas, but is it possible for us to re- rebuild parts of the design in a more of a root-like framework? And what I mean by that is a single set of core rules that all of the asymmetrical roles hang within, uh, and and to not have that hurt the spirit of the game. Uh, and, and that, I mean, there was it was a very intense period of development for the game, and I, I'm really happy with how it turned out. You know, basically. Uh, Everybody in the studio gets a development credit, and a lot of the meetings were myself and Nick and Patrick really sorting through, like, okay, is there a way to rebuild this role so that it looks, you know, if you just look at the game from the outside, it looks and feels exactly like the game did originally, but can we do that in half as many rules or as third as many rules? Um, and we use, uh, so we, we, uh, rely a lot on our editor, uh, Josh Yearsley, who's amazing. He's one of uh, my favorite editors to work with in the industry. And he, he actually flew into St. Paul a few times and 
and and and pl- played the game with us and helped us rewrite the rule book uh and we all felt very happy with how the, with how the game did um and yeah i'm trying to know what else to say about it. i mean i think uh if if you liked root and you wanted it to be a little less goofy like root can be goofy sometimes vast is considerably less random and uh that is especially true of the mysterious manner and so i think it's something to kind of keep your eye on if it is the sort of game you're interested in um i will say you should you, you should pre-order it because you get a free expansion and if you saw how root went uh, I don't want you to have to go to eBay and spend $150 on an expansion that we gave away for free. Uh, and of course, like we will do our best to keep everything in print. But like right now, that's the best way to get it. Uh, it's in production right now too. Uh, but it, yeah, lo, lo, like Root, it's very, very interactive um, and very asymmetrical. Uh, it has, a, it, it feels a little bit more like a tactics game, like an Into the Breach thing, whereas Root is more of a high level war game. All right. So let's uh, let's put Leader Games to bed for uh, a little while. And by the way, Drew Drew's in chat. So hi, Drew. Thanks for joining us, Drew being yeah, just, your brother. Yeah, he just uh, told me I should put a lamp on my desk. But yeah, yeah yes, but he he knows well fine. that there's no room for a lamp in this room. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So wearing multiple hats. Now you said that you like to work and dedicate all of your energy on a very small group of games be it one or two at a time you're talking about vast you're talking <laughs> about root you're talking about saga but there's this other game that you and drew have been working on uh the, in your spare time which what is that uh pax premier second edition so the original pax premier um through sierra madre games with phil eklund and and that whole crew what made you want to go back and revisit pax premier first off and second, um, how do you find the time to do this? So I'll, I'll answer the time question first, which is uh, you, you just don't sleep. It's real easy. I, I can relate um, to this. Yes, I understand. <laughs> and you'd think that coffee would help in such a venture, but I, I do not drink coffee because I find that I, I'll crash and I'll sleep much more if I have the ups and downs. Um, what? So the, it's mostly it, it's just old-fashioned time management. So like Pamir... I have pretty strict rules about like when I go to work, when I come home, I play with the kids, I help with dinner, kids go to bed. And then in the evening, I work on PAX Premier. And on the weekends, I would usually give my Sunday mornings to it and sometimes my Saturday evenings to, to, to PAX. Um, and you, you have to work slower when you're working like that. Um, but it, I mean, I basically, I gave PAX as much work as I gave something like John Company. It's just my day job was different. Um, and I, I found at least, especially once, uh, my wife and I had children that I was a lot more protective about my free time and I was a lot better at using it, uh, because I, I knew that boy, if the kid wakes up, there's no more work that's going to happen this evening. So I have to like really work quickly and work smartly. Uh, and so I'm always like, whenever we have a little quiet moment at work, I'm always thinking about. How could I work faster? Like, what is a better way to structure my files that will, like, you know, all these kind of boring questions about like process? Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about like, okay, what is the fastest way to build and set up a data merge? How can I build my prototype kits so they only take five minutes to construct instead of twenty minutes to construct? Uh, so it's it's a lot of little stuff like that. Cole Worley's life is a game. Okay, yeah, that, uh, that's resource true. maximizing, uh, right? Efficiency well, game. It's a, and a very tactical one at that. Um, so why I did. Why do Premiere 2? So I have weird feelings about second editions. I still haven't sorted through them. Um, usually, I think it's better to just do another game. Um, but PAX was special. Uh, it On the design side... So on the design side, a couple things happened. So I when I did the initial design, I had a really clear idea of what I wanted the game to be like. Uh, but when I was working with Phil, it drifted into kind of a different space. And I was I was happy with it because of course like I'm getting a game published, but I I didn't know what ideas to protect and when. Um, and when I when I finished the game, I wrote like a little design memo. And then when I was working on the expansion on Kyber Knives, I tried to answer some of those concerns. But I found that you just can't fix a game with an expansion. Because expansions are all additive. Like, they don't take away things. They add right, things. Right. 
And so there were there were problems where like so the easiest example here are like the capability cards in Kyber Knives, which give you special powers. After I finished Kyber Knives, I realized like, oh, those should have just like been in the deck, <laughs> like right at the start of things. Um, but I can't do that now because the deck already exists. Um, but even but adding the capability cards kind of like disrupted the general flow of the game and how like the velocity at which cards move through it. Um, and so in order to fix that problem, I had to introduce all these other mechanisms. And so at the end of Kyber Knives, you know, I was happy with Kyber Knives. I was happy with how, how Premier turned out, but I wrote myself like another design memo that was like, okay, if ever I revisit the space, this is how I do it. And it was like maybe a page or two, just nothing serious. Uh, and, and, I, and I put it to bed. Stopped working on it. Didn't really think about it. You know, I want. I was working on John Company. I was. I was working on Infamous Traffic. There were other things I wanted to spend my time on. Um, and then, uh, so a thing that happens. This happens, I guess, probably to most designers. Uh, when your game's out of print, people will try to buy it directly from you. Uh, and of course, you don't have any. Uh, so you say, you know, I'm sorry. Good luck on eBay. Um, <laughs> and and but eventually, with packs. Um, People wanted to buy it, and then uh, people wanted to help fund it, and then publishers started saying things like, hey, uh, can I publish another edition? And as soon as publishers started wanting it, I mean, I had at this point, I had worked for Leader. I had seen Tom start his game company with Holland Spiel, uh, and I had watched Phil do his. And, you know, Phil and I had, have, a, have a kind of strange relationship because I do all the development or most of the development, and then I cover, I get together my editorial resources, I do all the graphic design, and so, you know, when I gave Phil John Company, I just gave him the files and said, here's John Company, it's ready for the factory, and he just sent it on to the factory. Um, and I, I like this about Phil a lot, because there's a lot of trust, and he lets me kind of do my own thing. Phil being but, Phil Eklund. Yeah, Phil right, being right. Phil Eklund. Yeah. Um, and so, when it came to Premier... Uh, I didn't really want to sell it to anybody because I didn't know what a publisher could give me that felt fair. Um, and it's not that like there's that much money to be made on the back end, but there's enough that I wouldn't want to just give it away. Um, and so, you know, at, you know, we, I do, I help build the root Kickstarter campaign and that goes really well. And so around the winter, I, I just start fiddling with packs a little bit. And there were a few other things that happened around this time too. Like we had, I lost all of the Premier raw files due to a hard drive crash. I have the print files for the first edition of Premier, but the Dropbox that had the actual raw files like didn't get synced properly and got overridden and it's dumb and it doesn't matter. But like I didn't have them. And so I was just kind of low key like rebuilding the graphical assets. And while I'm doing that, I'm thinking like, boy, I learned a lot over the course of Root about how things should look in a game, how things should be structured. Uh, I mean, the original uh, PAX files are a, a total mess on the back end. Um, the actual game, I think, lo lo looks all right. But if you just poke on it a little bit, it was just, you know, I was still I was still learning how InDesign worked at that. I mean, a lot of the PAX cards were actually built in Photoshop because I was stupid. Um, I mean, I was, I just didn't, I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, well, so no, it, not stupid, just the learning process. That's all yeah, I mean, right. I, Ignorant I, maybe, but stupid. No. A lot of my, a lot of my own efforts in game design just started because I wanted to learn how graphic design worked and then everything kind of grew out of that. Um, but when it came to Premiere, you know, basically I, I was just working on it and then I like made a couple cards and said, okay, here's what a second edition card would look like. Uh, and then I I'd had this fun exercise where I went into the rule book and said, like, okay, I'm going to rewrite this rule book from scratch. Just how would it, like, because I, I've established more of a voice in my rule books. I have a better sense of how they should work. The, the, the PAX Premier rule book was structured explicitly on the Perfuriano rule book because uh, this is the best publishing tip I can give to new designers. Um, be a low friction operator. Do everything you can to make what you're doing look like something that they should already be publishing. It gives you a huge leg up. Um, but I, so I restarted the Premier rulebook from the from the space of just you know being a few games wiser, and I started rewriting it and realizing that there were all of these ideas I had that um, were adding a lot of rules overhead, and we're, and and we're not even if they weren't adding word count they were stopping the design from being much cleaner, which was closer to my original vision for the game. So that was all happening kind of over the winter, uh, mostly on weekends. And then I had this conversation with Drew, or really one of several conversations, 
where I just said, like, look, I have time to develop this game. I have time to do the graphics, the rules, the, the, all the product design stuff. I don't have time to learn how to manage a business. Um, and I love my brother, and I trust him a lot. And uh, he's he has helped me on every game project I've ever worked on. He's brilliant. And I just said, if you ever wanted a side hustle, if you wanted to just do this, we could be partners. I'll split everything with you um, because you're making it possible. And we can do it. And if, if not, it's fine. I'll just do this thing. And then maybe I'll sell it to somebody or I'll, you know, Phil can publish it again. But uh, if you, if you want to do this and be serious about it, we can do that. And, and Drew thought about it. And at this time, you know, we're, we, I think we got to know Jordan Draper and a few other people who are kind of pushing game production a little forward. And so we became vested in the idea of doing an edition of PAX kind of just for ourselves. Like this, you know, not going to worry about distributor margins, not going to worry about like getting rich and famous on this, just doing the game exactly the way we wanted to do it. And, uh, and Drew helped a lot with development, also helped a lot with the product design. Um, and then around after Root was done, so like Root, I was working on like a maniac. I mean, most of the days where I worked on Root were like 10, 12 hour days and the weekends were all Root all the time. Uh, and once Root ended, I had my evenings and weekends free again. What am I going to fill this with? Well, yeah, what am I going to fill? Well, and it, you know, it, it's one of those things where it's impossible to think about your next project, at least for me, while I'm really deep in a project. Um, or at least it's impossible to work on it. And then I'm always like, oh no, what if I, what if I don't have a project after this? And then it takes like a day and then I'm working on something else. <laughs> um, but so we started in, I think February and March and then in April starting to ramp it up. And then, you know, we, we just, we, we just, we, we worked on it, um, and, and pushed it and pushed it along. Uh, we formed a little company called Whirly Gig, which is just going to be for weird designs that we want to publish. We have a few kind of in line, and it doesn't necessarily have to be stuff that I've designed or Drew's designed, but um, it's just like it's just our little imprint. We don't really know what we're going to do with it. Um, I mean, again, I, I think projects, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think very tactically about all this stuff. Like, I'm, I, it, it seemed like a reasonable thing to sort of like go ahead and form a little side company, and then whatever that turns into, it'll turn into. And I like right now, for instance, like Drew is very busy because he's got a million obligations. And so it might be a little bit before we like get around to a proper John company reprint or something, but that's fine. I don't feel any particular r rush towards it. Um, so the, the other thing I'll say about PAX is I, I use a lot of the same playtesters from one product to another. I try to treat them well as best I can, and I really appreciate them. And uh, I have a weird, I expect them to tell me the truth. Uh, there is a thing about playtesters is um, you, there's a high attrition rate. A lot of them will go away after one project. And then the, the, the equally bad problem is that many of the ones that stick around just sort of love everything that you do. And you also have to like purge those people because what you, you don't need, want sycophants. You want somebody to give you, you want, legitimate feedback. Yeah. And with Pamir, I had a lot of playtesters who were unconvinced the project was good. Like, not even the individual game, but, like, could there be a good PAX game? Or do PAX games rely solely on the experience? And then, like, that the particular game itself was suffering. And they were so valuable. And I, 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 I could not credit them enough. I want to put their, their names in, you know, huge, large type all across the back of the rule book. Um, and so, actually, one thing that happened is uh, Drew and I thought we were ready to launch around June. And the, the design still had some problems, but it was mostly firing. And Drew and I were mostly really happy with it. And I sent it to uh, Dan Thoreau. Oh, I'm, we're getting a visitor. Oh, hey. Do you want to say hi? This is my son, Auden. Hi. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> you could go hey. Okay. See you later, kid. <laughs> um, that's, that's kid two. All right. Um, so... Uh, you know, we thought we were going to launch in June. I sent a review copy to uh, Dan Thoreau, who I respect so much. He's a wonderful Very, written yes. reviewer. Um, and I think just, the best written reviewer out there. I, I, I think yes. so. Um, and, you know, PAX was one of his favorite games. And I, you know, we always dedicate our work to the people who really love it. And he was like someone that I was like making Pamir for. I never told him that. 
but you know, I wanted him. If so, if there's one person on the planet I wanted to like the game, it would be like him. Uh, and he hated it. Oh, did he hate it? <laughs> um, the version of the game. Um, but he hated it in a way that he he wrote me. I you know I I I, I never want him to be a playtester. That that's a that's an imposition. But he hated it in a way that I didn't agree with. But in engaging with him, uh, he convinced me to rebuild parts of the design. And, you know, again, like I didn't rope him into playtesting after that, but I had that disappointment always in the back of my mind. So then over June, July, and August, we rebuilt the game a, a second time. And uh, it, it wasn't anything like a full rebuild, but they were small and consequential changes. Um, and then uh, by the time August rolled around, we had a pretty close to final version. I sent it to Dan again, and he played it, and he said, this is so much better. And, you know, this is undoubtedly a good game. He's like, I still like Premier One more, but this is a good game. And I said, that's fine. I'm going to prove you wrong on that. <laughs> and I'm not going to do it yet. And so, you know, I, I'm actually, I'm very interested to see what his his final take is going to be on the whole thing. Because, of course, after the Kickstarter is over, we, we took it through one more development round. Um, and I think certain of his concerns got addressed and cleaned up really nicely. We weren't necessarily, like, meaning to do that. It's just... He was right, and when he's right, he's right. Um, and you know, I so the whole process uh, was interesting on my side because it was both the hardest game I've ever worked on. Uh, just, I mean, we spent so long on like a single rule. Like, should this rule be yes or no? Should this value be three or four? Like those kinds of very small changes. Just months of testing to figure out, you know, should the hand size be permissive or restrictive. Like, should you be allowed to go over hand size and then discard? My God, we spent like six weeks on that. Um, but on the other hand, uh, this was probably the most fun product I've worked on. It was Why? It, because it was always interesting. And it also, like the game started, I, I never felt fatigued. Like usually any design I work on by the end, I am like ragged. This one never felt that way. It was why you, always. Why do you think that is though? Well, what, I mean, it was what sets it apart? It, well, the, the game started done and then got better, I think is, is one thing, right? Like it was always playable. Um, I didn't allow myself, I, I was never able to work myself to exhaustion working on it because like Owen has to go to school in the morning and I have to go to work after that. And so it was all, I was like switching. It was a lot of gear switching uh, and it, it kept the engine from overheating. Right. Whereas like usually, I mean, I think about like the, the last days of John company, I was, you know, submitting a draft of my dissertation. I was packing my house to move and I was submitting the final John company files. And when it came down to that submission, like I worked just day after day after day straight on that design um, and so by the end, I thought, I'm so happy this, this spirit has been like lifted. <laughs> this curse has been lifted. So on that note, do, do you learn anything from that on how to keep yourself fresh going forward? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, it, it's hard because so much of what you do is reactive, right? I mean, we, I know for instance, that in three weeks, I'm going to have to be pulling those same 12, 14 hour days, finishing the root expansion. Um, and I can better prepare for it. But I think with PAX, it really – so, you know, one of the lessons of Root was, my goodness, if I if this is the only thing that I have to do on my day, uh, I can work well and can work quickly, and it's wonderful. And one of the lessons of, of, of PAX was, at the same time, there is value to going slow. And so many of those lessons I've been trying to apply to Saga because Saga is never the first thing on my on my day. I have to, like – I have to earn it, right? If I get all my other work done, then I get an hour of saga time. Um, and uh, instead of being frustrated with that, uh, I think PAX taught me to like take real joy in working slowly through something. All right. Uh, and well, I guess I should thank Dan and you and, and Drew and everybody because I'll be honest, this is, this is pretty rare. rare. As a reviewer, you have to churn through games, just nature of the beast, right? And I'm almost never playing games unless they are for the show. And you being a friend, you also know that I'm going to call a spade a spade. 
That's and true. We played we played PAX Premier for the live stream on the cusp of PAX uh, East, and then I played it four more times during PAX East. <laughs> uh, Jess and I played uh, some two player games, which the game completely changes in a good way. That it's much more take that on people's tableaus, mm -hmm. uh, and and a lot more aggressive. In that regard, and we also played some three-player game, and the last game that we played at PAX East was a three-player game between myself, Jess, and Rainer, and I'll be honest, that was the highlight of PAX East uh, for us. Was <laughs> Thank you. The, the, the hall closed at midnight. We played till 12.15 because we were not willing to let that go without it being ending, or without it ending, and it was, it was a magical experience. So I think... Personally, I think it's going to be the most approachable of the PAX games, and I think it's going to be those that like the first edition of Premiere. This is so streamlined, and it's so much more approachable, even though it's still awfully opaque. I think those that like the first edition aren't going to become huge fans of the second edition because of how different it is. But, man, I, th I think this is... I think this is uh, this is special. I think it's a really I, damn good game. I mean, I of course I'm crazy biased about this, but I I think it's the best game I've made. I like it. I love Root. I'm always happy to play Root. I, I mean, I like a lot of the projects I'm working on. I'm not sometimes after your people are done with the project, they want distance, and because I make things that I want to exist, I I kind of I like playing um, my previous games if I have a willing audience, I'll do it. Um, but I really like how Pamir turned out. It is a game I really wanted to exist, and the second edition exists. And like your first edition copies have not like been set aflame; they're still there. Oh no, because they're very <laughs> different games. They, they, really they are, are very different game, and I'm 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 happy that you know in the development of this we have such a different um, profile, different product design. Like the uh, the second edition looks so different from the first edition you would never guess they were the same game um and you know even if you were to just compare the two rule books these are different animals i think that the second i do think the second edition is a better game uh it may not be the better experience for some players I, but I, it's, i'll buy that yeah i mean it's just i think it's more interesting i think that you are able to plan more you can be a lot more devious in it um it the strategies are more subtle. I think that the, I don't know, just the, the way the cards are balanced. There's just there's a lot there to explore. And for folks, if you like heavy interactive games, like you're just gonna find a lot to really grab onto in the design, um, in a way that I think is a little bit different from the usual PAX audience too. And uh, that I think the thing that I am most interested in uh, for this design is the people who are outside of the PAX audience, how they find their way in, and then if they decide to stay. I mean, I think that that is going to be a question that will kind of determine what projects I do in the future uh, with with respect to these types of historical design. Well, all right. So on that on that note, anything else, provided that Premier does well, the second edition. Sure, and yeah. That would stay in business. It's going to. Um, just, I th it's one that I'm going to push people towards for the simple <laughs> fact that it's the most approachable. It's the easiest to learn, honestly. And the barrier to entry in the pack series, I feel like has been pretty high just because of the nature of those games. Uh, but provided it does well, are there other topics or time periods or whatnot that you want to re or look into for the pack series? Yeah, so there, are, there there's a couple. So we want to do another printing of John Company. Uh, I I would li I just would like that game to be in print. Um, I hate the fact that it goes for so much money on the secondary market. It um, it is it was not an expensive game to produce, and it so it always it feels weird. Even though obviously like designs have value, it just feels odd that it that it costs so much uh, on eBay or something. Um, you know, I took out John Company uh, about a month ago and looked at it and just said, like, okay. And the same thing I did with uh, Premier, where I kind of asked myself, like, w is there a second edition here? Or am I doing something more like a representation of the existing edition? My guess is it's going to be mostly like the latter. I think that I can imagine a second edition of John Company that is very close to the first edition. 
uh, and probably like maybe even calling it a different printing. It's tricky because I do want to change certain things about the game's physical presentation to make it a little more accessible. But the actual core rules, I'm just kind of happy where they are. Um, the game's weird, it, and I'm I just kind of want it to stay what it is, how it is. I do have a way more accessible version of John Company, which I think I would like to do. Um, at leader games at a way additional date in the future, like maybe in two or three years. Um, because I think that uh, there aren't a lot of really good heavy negotiation games, and there's a way of spinning John Company uh, that I think would really resonate with people. Um, but that, that that's not answer to your question. Um, the the short term answer. I was going to make you come back to it. So no, no, it's no. All well, good. I, it's all good. I usually circle back. Um, <laughs> so the short answer is there is potentially another printing of John Company in the pipeline. Um, because Drew is busy and because I'm busy, this is going to look like Q1 2020 for the Kickstarter, and then maybe release later that year. Um, because I just, I mean, like right now we have capital that we could just reprint John Company, but I have, I want to go through the rules again and do like a proper. You want to do it right. Reprint. Yeah, I want to do it right. Yeah, I don't like. That's let, fine. I think that to me, one of the biggest takeaways about me working in this industry has just been, I don't like rushing things. I don't like, I want it to be, I want the, the ultimate thing to be really, really good. I'm not, I don't consider myself a perfectionist, but I, if I know that I can do it better, I want to like stop the presses. Do it and better. here's the thing. Don't get me wrong. I say this as somebody who owns all the games, so I, I, it's a luxury to be in the position I'm in. But even so, even if I didn't, dude, do you? It's ready when it's ready, and I yeah. think I think the fans of your games want that, and and they're willing to wait because you know what? It's going to be worth the wait. We have plenty of games, right? To, well, to, and this is the, this is the, the nice meantime. thing of. This is the nice thing about not being on the the, the churn treadmill. Uh, I think John Cummings is a great game. It's still going to be a great game in three years. Right. Like, it's not going anywhere. Um, there's a guy named uh, Jeff Vogel uh, who runs Spiderweb Software, and he makes a bunch of these like weird computer RPGs. I I I, uh, I watched one of his GEC talks. It's on YouTube, and it really resonated with me because his whole his whole attitude was, I make games in my garage. I really like them. They all look like they're from 1996. But I think they were good games in 1996, and they're still good games in 2015. And if you have a big enough audience that like doesn't mind an old school looking game, then it doesn't really matter. You just keep making things that are good. So I'm not I'm not worried about like rushing anything to market good. or trying trying to capitalize on root hype or something. That's like that's not my style at all. Um, the other thing that Drew and I are working on is we are working on a game about reconstruction. Um, which is meaning post Civil War. In the post US? Civil War, so it'll cover the twelve years after the Civil War. Um, originally, I'd almost imagined this like a straight up coin game, like a coin game that I would give to GMT, um, where the sides would be like the U.S. government under Grant, both the like um, his his military governorship, or that's not exactly the title, but when he was managing the Southern states and then his presidency, and then uh, the Radical Republicans and the newly freed slaves. And then uh, the moderates and the, the 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 radical Christians and the KKK as different parties. Um, this is heavy, heavy, heavy stuff, though. Uh, and it's not a period that I engage lightly. And so I've been doing a lot of research and talking to a lot of very, very smart historians about how to do this game right. But it feels – so So originally it was going to be a traditional coin game. Uh, as I started hashing out mechanisms, I realized it was something else totally. So I, I thought, okay, well, maybe I can do this with my own imprint. Um, this is not a game that I necessarily want to make because I think the subject is really tricky. And, yeah, uh, especially in the political climate where we're no, at right now. Yeah, I, I, and, but – so I think that the, the subject is complicated and very, very, very uncomfortable. Um, but not enough people know the story of Reconstruction. It gets taught really poorly in schools. I think that a game is actually a really good way of presenting it. And I also feel like I have a lot of good resources, uh, people in the Academy who know a lot more about this than I do, um, that I'm in a pretty good position to actually make the darn game. And so it's a it's a weird place. I mean, this is when I was working on Pamir, I had a weird moment where I my my 
my dissertation advisor asked me why I was kind of like trying to get Premiere done. Uh, or actually, it wasn't Premiere, it was John Company. He was like, look, you're, you know, you're finishing your dissertation, you're moving, you're doing all these things. Why are you trying to finish this board game? And I told him, like, I just felt like if I didn't do it, that game would never happen. And so it just, I wanted to, I was in a position where I could finish a project. And so I just, I wanted to finish it. And that feeling I can feel welling up when it comes to this reconstruction game. Like it isn't necessarily a product I would choose to do, but I find myself in a position where I feel like I'm in a good spot to actually execute it. And a responsibility, it sounds like. Yeah. I mean, it's, I just, it isn't, you know, um, there are just a lot of really good people have entrusted a lot of faith in me. And, and I don't mean this uh, just in terms of people who like my games. I mean, people who are in the university who work on this area, who want to see more exposure to it um, outside of like an AP US history classroom. And for that, like that is reason enough to kind of like gather my notes and push the design. Uh, history games take a really long time to work on though. So this is again, like a, this is a 2021 project. Um, but it is something that I am actively thinking about. And so I'm always, you know, when I'm at cons, that the reconstruction game is the one I end up talking about the most because I know that, hey, someone that I'm talking to, uh, they might be um, an African studies professor who like, you know, they have, the, they're, they're really interested in, you know, these free schools and they, they connect me with, with this museum and they've got an archive. And so I'm trying to just build those relationships um, so that when, when time, when the time comes to actually assemble the game, um, you have those resource materials, yeah, I have, right? Yeah, yeah, because none of these things happen overnight. I mean, I spent a lot of time reading about Afghanistan and talking talking to people about it before before I even started designing the mechanisms. Which I guess what this means is uh, that redraw of Union versus Central probably is. Not. I'm sorry, it's just not. It's funny too, right? I, like I had this, I have a joke with Drew. Where I'm like, you know, Drew. We could buy it from Winsome and do a new edition if we wanted. <laughs> like I don't know, maybe they've already sold it to someone else. But I can't imagine that ever has a market. I mean, let's no, face it's it, just it's, no one. I mean, so this is. Uh, I mean, Tom Russell folks, would look at this game and be like, "No, no." It's just for folks that don't know it. Universe Central is. I don't even know what to call it. It's like a weird. It's okay. So what it is? It's two things. It is a amazing uh experience history game like circa 1970 this is going to take eight hours to play like let's just let's just live in the period it's about the building of the transcontinental railway but what what what, what i what drew uh, what, what drew me to the game is that it is an extremely interesting logistics game that takes place on a single dimension like it's or i guess yeah it, it's just a line yeah yeah so you have a small line and you're trying to draw a longer line. And uh, like once you play it, you think like, boy, it's more complicated than roads of boats in, in terms of the ramifications, the scheduling of everything. Um, and yet, you know, roads and boats has way more pieces. Uh, I love it deeply. I wish, I wish somebody else would publish it so I don't have to, but like, I, I'm telling you, Edward, like if two, if in three or four years, I'll make a promise to you. If in three or four years, nobody has touched universe central, I will I will go to to John's house and I will I will plead with him to give me the license because like it should just be in print like anybody who is interested in in logistics design like designs around a logistical puzzle like they should be playing Universal Central and the game is obscenely expensive right now right and that's why I don't have a copy so all right I'm gonna hold you to it I, now for those that don't know this has been a running joke between Cole and I for three years, four years, whatever it is. Yeah. Been... I started a fan redraw right. Like the right before I got very busy with everything and it just never, it never moved and on. So I, I keep prodding him. Hey, Hey, what's up with that? What's up? So, uh, all right. So heaven's mandate seven years ago. Um, uh, the, uh, so heaven's mandate, the reunification of China, um, any interest in ever re-looking at something like that or yeah a little bit I mean, it's um, not like you don't have you know things you have plenty of free time what's up yeah i heaven's mandate's tricky uh because it exists i don't know even know if i have it here it's probably at a friend's house or something but um it was like my attempt to do a three kingdom style game um and it 
I don't know. It kind of worked. It, but I it also, so it was like three things. I wanted a dynasty driven game uh, that was somewhat generational. I wanted it to be an accessible war game and I wanted it to, um, to be this like big history bash. And all of the, like I've stolen from that design so much because a lot of the like combat system and route has a sort of tangential relationship to the one I used in that design. Um, the dynasty system framework that I'm building into Saga is taken kind of from that game. Um, it just never got to the point where I felt really happy with it. So and basically it, you have made that game just a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit over there. Yeah, exactly. There. It's like it, it was an early stage design that I plunder, and it, it's weird that it's on BGG, but it was because like – it was at a point where there were copies of it floating around. Like I think I made three. Um, and so people were like, where, where should I write about this game? And I was like, oh, I'll make a BGG page. Because at that time, BGG page, I mean, this was like 2008 maybe or something, 2007? I don't know, around there. Um, and and so like I, I, I still am really interested in uh, that period of Chinese history, but there are better people for making that game than I am. I think, like, because here's the thing, right? Like, I don't speak Chinese. There's a big, which, again, I feel like doesn't disqualify me. It just means I have a lot of work that I have to do in order to make that design. I mean, obviously, like, I made a design in Afghanistan. So I I think that w when you're outside of, 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 of the, the, the people and of the story, and we're all outside of the story because these games took place a long time ago, but your distance from that story, you have to make it up somehow. And at least in my case, I find that it's like more reading, more networking, more meeting people, more talking to people. It's just a lot of legwork. Yeah, it's time and uh, effort. Yeah, it's time and effort. And so I – to me, there's – for 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 me, one of the most important elements of my design practice is there has to be an urgency to the design. Um, Root felt urgent because I felt like, okay, there are all these people entering the hobby. They don't have any exposure to – conflict games because there are all these barriers to entry so I want to like there's an urgency that's motivating that design um, and it isn't necessarily like a market urgency it's like an intellectual urgency um, and I think you know with with, with the pack with, with Premier and with John Company and Infamous Traffic those are all games where I felt like the East was really being badly represented in board games and I even I even cringe when I use the phrase the East but it was just I'm using that as a constellation for all of these themes that were just being done badly uh, and because of my academic training, I felt like I, I was in a better position to intervene. And, you know, even the game about re Reconstruction, like, I feel a lot of urgency in that. Like, we, I think Reconstruction has done more to shape our time than just about any other period in American history. And I want people to engage with it, frankly. The trick with Heaven's Mandate is I don't feel that same urgency about the Three Kingdoms period of Chinese history. It's a great, interesting period. But it, it 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 isn't it isn't I don't feel like it's as prescient enough. That's maybe not the right way to use that word. I don't feel it it doesn't have the, the same kind of immediacy that I think Reconstruction does. And for that reason, I'm leaving it to other people. All right, fair enough. Uh, all right, so uh, I got I have two last things before we wrap it up. One, um, when are you going to design a train game? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. Well, you know, the reconstruction game will have trains. Definitely will have trains. trains Fair are enough, part of it. right? Um, I, I've tried. I, I can't quite get it to them to work in the way that I want them to work. Okay. Um, I, I have a weird barrier to it because I, as as Edward knows, I play a lot of train games. Um, people at the office poke fun a little bit at it, but I, I love train games. I just. It's weird to be making games because you love them, but also not be able to work in the genre you most love, right? Right. Well, I, I, I found it hysterical. I was trying to keep my composure during our live stream of Pax Premier when you when you referenced uh, for you 18xx. It, it, right. It's this. Well, it's this. Yeah, if, if you want my train game, play play Pax. Right. That's That was hysterical. That was uh, well done. Um, so there were a couple other questions here, but honestly... Um, it's been an hour and 45 minutes, and I think this has been pretty amazing. So the last thing before we wrap it up is uh, name name some of the latest good books that you've read. Oh, it's a dangerous question. Um, what have I been succinct. reading lately? Succinct. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. so 
as Edward knows, I read a lot. I like books. Um, let's see. Lately, uh, I have been loving um, N.K. Jemisin's The Broken Earth Trilogy. Incredible. Brilliant. I am a little out of practice with my sci-fi and my fantasy, but my goodness, it's wonderful. Um, the first one is called The Fifth Season. It'll rip your heart out. It's brilliant. I love it. Um, Nenendi Okorafor's Bindi books, uh, sorry, Binti, uh, are wonderful. They feel like a um, really interesting Afrofuturist spin on Ender's Game. Very good. Uh, in terms of more contemporary stuff, I really like Jennifer Egan's Manhattan Beach. Great read. So well, lots of fiction lately. I don't know. I didn't mean to spout three fiction. Those are the yeah. last that I read. Um, well, I mean, fair enough. I mean, let's face it. You read so much nonfiction for design. You know, yeah, that, 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 that's true. Um, yeah, but yeah, lately I've been reading a lot of novels and really enjoying it. Um, yeah, I, I could go on and on. I, I should stop before I before I give your guys <laughs> give, give your listeners another dozen books. I don't think anybody will complain, but we're trying to. I do have to make dinner at some point mm -hmm. tonight too, and I know you have youngins to address. So, that's all true. right. So, I know I did this last time, but we're going to do it again. A series of six fun yet thoughtful questions have to be quick fire off the top of your head. Are you ready, okay. Cole? Uh, yes. All right. How old? Oh, uh, Siri apparently thought I was talking to her. All right. <laughs> how old would you be if you didn't know how old you are? Uh, 35. Why? I, I, I talk a lot. I talk too much. <laughs> so that somehow <laughs> references 35? Yeah. Okay. All right. If you could be the master of one skill that you do not have right now, what would it be? It could be anything. I wish I were was better at learning languages. Okay. Uh, you and me both, by the way, I've been watching this yeah. show called The Food Ranger on YouTube. It's a Canadian who lives in China who goes around the world eating street food. And he picks up words and phrases here or there. You have Bangladesh, and Pakistan, all over. Eats all this amazing food and tries to talk with the locals. It's amazing how he picks this stuff up. I yeah. cannot do that. Yeah, I am I am bad at it. And I, and I want to be good at it. The same. Uh, if you could have dinner and conversation, any person in history, who would it be? Pick one. I hate this question. I know. Uh, it's... Mm, who do I want to talk to? I, let's see. Oh, man, you're killing me. Mm. <laughs> I, have no, I have no good answers for this. Um... I mean, you're 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 reading all these books. You're, you're I know, I know, but it's but it, but it, it's I don't know. It's like what 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 do these people care about what I do? Um, I want to have uh, I want to talk to H.G. Wells. That's who I want to talk to nice. because he's you know he's founder founder of sort of modern gaming a little bit, uh, but he was also like an incessant weirdo who famously would like make people play weird games at dinner parties and you know it was always sort of one step too close to like a Victorian hell. <laughs> like you're, you're being made to play these funny word games and you're just trying to eat. And sometimes I've heard that his parties were great and other times um, just he, he seemed like a goofball and nobody liked it. But I think I think he'd be an interesting conversation because his mind was so wide ranging and crazy. Excellent. All right. What are three things you want more of right now? Could be physical characteristics, ideas, anything or time. Ooh, uh, time. Always. Yeah, always time. Sleep. Um, <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't want any more sleep than I've got. Um, yeah, what do I want more of right now? I want. I want more time. I, and I'll say specifically, I want more time to read. Thing one. I want more time to write. Thing two. And I want more time with my extended family. Thing three. Who I only get to see, you know, a few times a year. And if I had my way, I'd see them every week. Okay. Excellent. I, I appreciate all of those things. I would love more time to read especially i would love that yeah what do you appreciate most in your friends i appreciate their, their humor their sense of levity i think that's the thing doesn't matter what any of us are doing uh, or how bad or good our days were there is um the, there, there's no gassing up it's an honesty and a humor about everything that grounds me i like that and I feel like this is a gimme whenever I talk to you about this, but what's your absolute dream job? 
the one I've got. Yeah. The one I've got. It's true. Yeah. It's not a it's not not a job I looked for, but I'm gonna hold on to it as tight as I can. Well, you and I were talking about when we were on our way back from dinner, um, how you had other job offers, but the location and the ideal of what it is and the freedom that this job provides you to be expressive is hard to match. Yep, that's absolutely right. So good stuff, man. Well, hey, I appreciate it, my friend. Thank you very much for this. I think everybody watching live uh, really enjoyed this, it seemed. Um, and and there really weren't a whole lot of questions. It was more or less just, wow, everybody was enthralled listening to you. So I appreciate you taking the time, man. Thank you very of course. much for this. And they can hit me on Twitter. I answer, I answer all questions, even rules questions on Twitter. Because <laughs> <laughs> you have so much free time. Uh, and that's, uh, for those that are watching live, you can see it. But for those that are listening on the podcast after the fact, uh, it's at Cole C-O-L-E-W-E-H-R-L-E. That, that yep. H throws me every I know. time. Man. <laughs> oh, and real quick, uh, somebody was saying that the Root Kickstarter has something like six hours left on it. So if you're interested, uh, since this is going to be coming out on the podcast tomorrow and the Kickstarter will have been closed already, will folks be able to late back and all that? Yep. Uh, we use Backer Kit. They'll be able to late back. So don't don't worry. But definitely, if you're interested in this game, back it. We give our backers lots of free stuff. Most of our business at Leader is direct sales. So we try to treat them right. Okay. And last plug for PAX Premier. Folks can still get it for, on. Go ahead. Yeah. If you're, in, if you're in North America, you can get it still on Backer Kit. It'll be open uh, probably for another month or so, and then after that, we'll have a we'll have our excess stock on Shopify. Uh, these are going to sell out, and then it'll be a while before they get reprinted. So if you want it, now is the time to get it. Uh, if you don't li live in North America, Phil uh, and Ion have some copies that they will be selling a few hundred copies. So at some point, those will go uh, up on the Sierra Madre Games Store, and you can buy them then. There you go. All right. Thanks again, Cole. Thanks, everybody, for watching live. Don't forget, like and subscribe down below. You want to support the show and encourage more of these, you can go over to pledgehc.com and support the show over there. All right, Cole, I will see you, I guess, at Origins, I think. That's right. right. I'm right. looking forward to it. All right. Take care, my friend. Thanks, everybody. Right. Take care, y'all.